Now it's time to set our sights on what's to come. 2021 is going to be a massive year for the evolution of Siege, and the entire team has been diligently preparing for this very moment. So now, without further ado, our dev team is proud to introduce their vision for the future of Siege. With the pandemic, the work from home situation, last year was a challenge for all of us. This being said, I'm really, really proud of the work that the whole development team across the world has been doing on Siege. We've brought amazing content during year five and hope the players really enjoyed what we brought. Starting in year six, season one, uh, what we're gonna be doing is having the operator inside of the battle pass as the first reward alongside the hits exclusive headgear and uniform that usually was in the year pass. Along with that, we're uh, extending the period going from one week of early access to two weeks. Uh, and this two weeks period is going to be tied all of this at the same price uh, for the battle pass. So during year six, we're gonna have our new operators, obviously, every season. These new operators, as I said, are gonna be in the battle pass. In season one, we'll be going into Argentina. The second half of the year, we'll be visiting Europe. So Croatia in season three, and then visiting Ireland in season four. And in season two, we're really, really excited. We're going in the northern prairies of North America. Our newest operator will be from Nakoda, which are indigenous people from that region. Also, along the year, we'll be shipping our usual map reworks. So in season one, we're gonna be starting with Border. We wanna make it even more competitive than it is today. Season two, uh, after the house rework that we done last year, we wanna do another casual rework. What this means is that we're going to be going and heading into Favela. In Season 3, we're going to be trying something different. Instead of having one big map rework, we're going to be doing small reworks on multiple maps. And in Season 4, we're actually going to go back to Outback. As always, we're going to be having our seasonal event every season. Alongside, uh, we're going to have arcade playlist, so small gameplay laboratory. We're going to be trying new things, so look out for those. During the year, we're also going to be bringing core gameplay features and content in the game. We really want to use the test server to iterate on those and once it's ready, ship it on live. Uh, the quality of service that we're bringing to the players is of the utmost importance for us and uh, we really want to keep focusing on this and make improvement into the connectivity and DDoS issues that we had for the past years. We're changing a bit how we're going to uh, use the TS. We're going to push things that are uh, far from over. Uh, and where we need feedbacks as early as possible to adjust things in advance. So it's very possible, for instance, that you see some very big gameplay systems land in the TS, but not come in the live version of the game before at least two more seasons, because we want to take the time to adjust them based on feedbacks. I think we have two major opportunities and way of improvements during the, during the next year. Um, I think the first one is going to be less downtime. And uh, the second aspect would be onboarding. Uh, being more welcoming to new players is also something that uh, we believe is very, very crucial to the future and success uh, of our games. Uh, we want the game to be really nice to play and nice to watch, uh, especially when it comes to downtimes. Uh, when you play the game, I think there are moments where it's really tense and you feel like really, you're really pulled into the action, and that's mostly during the action phase. But during other phases, like the planning phase, the prep phase, or everything that happens after you die during a round, it feels like very often you don't have that much to, not that much that can really influence uh, the outcome of the round. So the general idea is that we want the players to be able to um, have a clearer impact on how the round is going to end. Uh, whether during the planning phase or even during the prep phase and uh, activities after death. Uh, the imbalance in favor of defenders has become uh, an issue. It's really hard to attack in the current metagame. The metagame itself is evolving, but we want to try to attack the issue on a deeper level. And uh, we're going to take the opportunity because we're already working on big gameplay uh, changes, uh, big system changes like uh, the attacker's repeat. And um, we're going to use this opportunity to try to uh, favor attackers a bit more than defenders and rebalance a bit the game so that it feels a bit more fair to play as an attacker. For onboarding, I think the high-level objective is that we're never going to lower the ceiling. The game needs to remain as complex and as beautiful as it is today, but we're going to make the floor easier to reach. We need to give better tools for the community to welcome new players, and we need everyone to work towards having a more inclusive uh, community. Uh, I think it's going to be a win for everyone. Currently in Rainbow Six, 
Uh, the onboarding is mostly done by the community and your friend, and we really want to help solo players to get in by themselves. That's why we are creating a cell dedicated to onboarding, and the goal of this cell will be to help those players get in faster, beyond the maps, beyond the guns, beyond the gadget, and all the operators that are specific to Rainbow Six. So rank is currently our most competitive aspect of the game that you can play right now. And we really want to improve it. And that's why we are working currently on reworking the ranking system to allow people to really improve season after season and have a better idea of uh, their skill level. So matchmaking, it's a tough subject, of course. The goal is to give all the players the match that are the most fair for everybody. And it works quite well, but sadly, a lot of people try to lie to the, to the system, uh, either by creating a new account that we, we call Smurf, or by uh, trying to derank and, and, and fake their, their, their skill level. So we are always trying to do small improvement to the matchmaking system to fight this. It's a, it's a tough battle, but uh, we are improving every season against that. The reputation system is starting to work in the background for a while now, and the first goal of the reputation system is to feed back to the player his uh, behavior inside the game. So to know if you are a toxic or a good player. And depending on your score, you can expect some sanction or reward, of course. 2020 was definitely a challenge for esports as well. The point system was heavily impacted by last year's situation, we were not able to have global competitions putting the teams from different regions against each other. So we believe that we have built a very robust and solid system with the point system. We really want to stress test this in 2021. With our learnings from 2020, we're pretty confident that we can make global majors once again um, this year in 2021. February next year is going to be our World Championship once again. Uh, it's the sixth, sixth Invitational as well, so a big anniversary event for us. And we're bringing back the event to Montreal, the first place of Siege. We have uh, still a lot of work to do, but I think the creativity that this game brings is unmatched. And I see that Siege will continue to grow and to stay the best possible. You've already gotten a glimpse at a new look for Siege, and this is just one of the many aspects of the game that we're updating this year. Let's hear more about the new visual style, as well as the new features coming from our player behavior cell. We always want to do better. We always know that we haven't reached our full potential yet as a game. Uh, so whether or not it's onboarding, or making sure newcomers feel welcomed with the game, and our mission is, over the next year, we'll completely revisit all of the menus in the game, refresh them, and bring them up to that standard that we hold. On top of that, we also have a new logo, we have new key art, and we're very happy with it. This is a high-energy, high-impact game with a diverse cast of characters and gameplay. And we stay true to the roots of the game as well. So everything our community knows and loves still feel like this is the real spirit of the game we're looking at. Since two years, we created a cell composed of two teams, player behavior and anti-cheat teams. We are still focusing on anti-cheat. This is really important. This is a sensitive uh, subject for us, for our community, and this is something that is a core pillar to our game. And we will continue to find solutions in order to block cheaters that are ruining the gaming experience of our community. Anti-cheat is a, a sensitive subject because they can counter all solutions really easily, depending on if we are giving a lot of details. Based on this, we will continue to communicate to our player through dev blogs about all anti-cheat initiative because this is really important and we will try to give as much uh, details as we can. So during the last year, we were building the reputation system. Right now, the reputation system is live in shadow, meaning it doesn't take any action into our players. But 
we will continue to improve and gather data related to this system. And right now we have a reputation score that is applied to all players. The, the system will come with a sanction and rewards. This reward will be based on the reputation uh, scoring. The reward will be specific items. It will be high level rewards and we will uh, have like different way to distribute them. And this rewards will also be removed when somebody is going back to a wrong uh, reputation score. First, we want to work on the preventive sanction related to the reverse friendly fire. We want to work on uh, the, the people that are uh, abusing the text chat and the voice chat. So we want to uh, add sanctions that will prevent these abuses because it's not normal that right now we have people that are very toxic through these channels. And then after that, depending on your reputation score, you will be able to access some content or some content will be blocked to you. So a player that have a bad reputation score will not have, for example, uh, any more an access to the ranked playlist. But it doesn't mean that he cannot access it back. He will have the tool to better understand how and why he get sanctioned. Based on this, he will be able to uh, change his behavior and better understand why it was seen as toxic. Right now, we have uh, we have seen uh, some uh, frustration related to stream and queue sniping. We are aware this is a problem for all community and for all content creator. So right now, uh, the team, the player behavior team, is working on a new solution, a solution called Streamer Mode that will be uh, available at the first part of year six. The settings that will be available to all content creator and all streamers will be first, hi my name. They will be able to hide their region and pings, but also they will be able to hide everyone else in order to prevent queue sniping, be able to uh, have a hidden matchmaking delay, hide clearance level, and they will be able to hide the profile image. Smurfing is a big problem for our community. We have many faces and we need to approach them with a different strategy for each of them. Right now, we increased the clearance level for the ranked playlist. We will also add some restriction to the ranked playlist in order that players that were inactive or got their account hacked or uh, uh, an account that has been buried cannot come right now to the ranked playlist without a play experience in all the playlists. And after that, we will also control a bit more how we are giving XP in terms of PV. Uh, just in order to have better cohesion and a good experience for everyone. When we made the decision last year to deliver just one new operator per season instead of two, it allowed us to create new cells within the team to focus on the way the game is played outside of the action phase. This led to some interesting opportunities and opened up new avenues to address the balance between attackers and defenders. Let's hear more. The idea with the attacker epic is to allow to each attacker uh, player to change his operator and his loadout as many times he wants uh, during all the preparation phase. They will adapt their strategy according to the information they will gather. And for defenders, designing the information becomes uh, more important. So for example, they will have to chase drones or uh, hide some of their operators. The preparation phase will be much more meaningful. Currently, uh, defenders have a better uh, win rate. So with these new tools for attackers, I think this will balance this. And in addition, we should be able uh, to build new operators around this uh, new game flow. So for example, the defenders specialize in designing crucial information. Five seconds before insertion. So the goal here is to keep players interested even after their death. For attack side, you will have full access to your drones that were pre-placed on the map. You can control them and use their abilities. You can use shock dart of uh, Twitch or the laser of Zero. For defense side, it's pretty much the same uh, behavior. You have uh, also full access to your camera's drones and also their abilities. So that means the sonic burns of Echo 
or the laser of the Maestro turret. Defenders can felt overlimbing by the attacker's runs, so we try to counterbalance that by reworking the bulletproof camera. So now the camera can rotate, and you can shoot an EMP dart that disable uh, all attacker electronic in world gadgets. So that means you can disable uh, drones, but also air jabs, uh, claymore, etc. So I think we should observe uh, an increase in uh, player activity, less downtime, and uh, the player will have uh, more playtime and fun. We will try to add an uh, early version uh, in the test server around year 6 season 2. So we are rethinking how the test server is used. The goal is to add early version to get uh, feedback as soon as, as possible and then iterate on it. So player uh, bah, will have more playtime uh, to be familiar with this uh, huge change. We are changing the speed armor system to a speed and health system. So no more reduction that you don't understand or you don't see. We will remove all the modifiers from the armor that you, you used to have. We're making sure that everything that was going under the hood is now exposed to the player. Two armor and three armors will have more HP available to them, making you more confident to plant the diffuser, take some engagements and everything. This is the first step that we are taking to make sure that the speed and armor is more of a choice for you. We will introduce the Gun 6, which is an hybrid between a weapon and a gadget. It will replace your secondary weapon, but it will shoot something that will destroy bulletproof gadgets. So it's a secondary weapon that is mostly aimed toward removing utilities. You will have one shot, it will travel straight just like Ash Launchers or Kali's Lance. One of the things that this weapon does not have over uh, secondary pistols, it doesn't bring you the speed movement modifier that you usually have with a pistol. Drone activated. If you bring this up in a firefight, you are most likely toast. So that's one of the balancing things that is super interesting with the GAN-6. It's you make a choice over reliability or removing utility. We can't talk about tackling the 20-second meta without talking about Goyo and how he's going to be rewarded. Uh, first of all, we are removing the shield. There won't be any shield. It will be only the Falk and Jerry can that you will have in hand. You will be able to deploy it similar to an ADS uh, bulletproof camera. We are still working on the shape of the object, so we're still tackling this, but the shield is gone for sure. Lucy is one uh, of the other worst offender for the 22nd meta. We are keeping the behavior mostly as it is, so you enter the range, it starts emitting sound and slow you down. But when it becomes active, it will expose a weak point. You will be able to shoot it, destroy it. So we keep the, the mind game or the, you know, the baiting game that we have with this gadget, but we're making sure that you don't feel helpless when facing this gadget. We are bringing a small nerf to Mira and Maestro. If you get close to a, an evil eye, you can melee it to remove the vision completely. Maestro himself will have to open the evil eye to see through or to ping or actually shoot with it. And the same can be applied to Mira's window. If you go on the black side and you melee it, you will remove section of vision for Mira on the other side. We have fuse that will receive some changes along the way. We want to make sure that the gadget is more useful all the time. We also have Finca that will receive some changes to her uh, nano boost. She will be able to use them once she's down herself, so she will be able to raise herself back, similar to what we have with Doc. So far, we've covered a lot of what's to come for Siege, but we're not done yet. We have more to share on the tireless work our teams on the technical side have done to improve the quality of life across the board. And because we always like to send you out with something special, not only do we have an update on Elite Skins, but we are also excited to reveal a few very cool partners we're working with this year. One of the first things we did for the connectivity issues is we, we looked at the performance of the game servers and we optimized it to make sure that we're hitting that smooth 60 frames a second update rate. We're all the time, we're trying to improve our tools, improve our monitoring, 
just being able to get uh, metrics on the, the community, the, what the issues that they're facing and improving those metrics. If you remember in the past, in the previous wave of DDoS attacks we had, we, uh, we improved our defenses and all that, that inspired like a new wave of attacks that are much bigger. And what we found this time is that the attacks are not just hitting the game server that they're targeting, there's actually a kind of splash damage that's uh, impacting many more game servers than the original, the, the intended target. So what we've done recently is we've taken steps to, to mitigate that impact and we've managed to bring down the, the impacted game servers by 90%, which is uh, fantastic. But one of the things we plan on doing is to break the benefit that DDoS attackers have when they attack our game server. And to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to pass different address information about the game server to each of the teams. That way, when one of these addresses is attacked, we can tell which team attacked us and we can make sure that they don't benefit. So a game as successful and long running as Siege obviously has many con content updates and each of these updates increased the base install size. So we're actually using some cool new texture technology to reduce the, the, the size taken by the textures without losing any visual quality. So we're also looking to, to download customization items on demand rather than include them in the base install. This should drastically decrease the size of the install. The smaller our game is, the easier it is for our players to try out and become lifelong players. Starting uh, later this year, our elites are going to be customizable. What this means is that you will be able to use the uniform from an elite alongside with the headgear from an event, for example. You can have a Tachenka uniform alongside with his headgear from Rainbow is Magic. What this means is that the gadget is going to be a skin, uh, eventually the operator card also. All of this are going to be different uh, customization options that we'll be bringing for uh, the players. We can use the victory dance of the elite with any type of customization that you have. So you can use the full event uh, skin that you, uh, that you want, but have the victory dance from the elite. So we can't wait to see the, the, the player's expression on using this. We, we took a look uh, at uh, the excitement that LabraCraft, for example, brought up last year, and we wanted to find new partners for this year. We're really excited to partner up with Capcom for the, one of the biggest franchises uh, in the gaming industry. From season one, we're going to have uh, an elite skin on Jill Valentine for Zofia, but it's not all. In season two, we're also going to have another uh, elite skin from the Resident Evil franchise, but stay tuned for more information on this. So we also wanted to try something that we haven't done before and that is something unique. Uh, we've partnered up with someone that we're huge fans of that works in the video game industry. Uh, she's actually a big fan of Rainbow Six Siege, so she's going to be t doing her take on our operators. So check this out. CG euh, moi, ce qui m'a frappé tout de suite, c'est sa spontanéité et une, un côté vraiment, euh, je ne sais plus comment on dit en français, mais genuine, tu vois, vraiment euh, euh, ouais, tout de suite, en fait, mise à l'aise. Ah, j'adore ce que vous faites sur Rainbow, c'est mortel, etc. Et donc, en fait, une discussion qui démarre hyper spontanée autour du jeu. Donc, vraiment, euh, ouais, c'était un super chouette moment. とにかく読む、読んで、あの、オペレーターに何か繋がりがないかっていうのをずっと考えてたんですね。プラス、あと、あの、私がじゃあ中村育美が好きにデザインをするって言ってユーザーたちが期待するものは何だろうって考えた時
vraiment hyper unique et qui t'appartient. Ah oui, donc c'est vraiment... C'était dans les étoiles. Quoi. Donc vraiment, c'était magnifique, magnifique. あの、なんだ、ゲームのスキンってあ、いろんな種類を増やすためだけ作られているものとかも多かったと思うんですけど、今回は本当にテーマ性を持ってで、このスキンのあやかしコンセプトがすごく良ければ、えっと、55、57体
Flores brings style and substance to any attacking team. If you're looking to boost your explosive capabilities beyond a Flores pick, then Crimson Heist has just the thing, the Gon 6. It's a new secondary weapon option for some attackers that comes loaded with a single explosive round to help you clear out all sorts of bulletproof gadgets. You may only have one shot, but sometimes all it takes is one round to change a round. Speaking of rounds, the ones you've been seeing here have all played out on the new border map rework. Crimson Heist is coming soon to Rainbow Six Siege, bringing the Gone Six and Border Map rework free to all players at launch. The new attacker, Flores, will be available at launch through the Crimson Heist Battle Pass as the first unlock of the premium track, and will be available two weeks later for purchase with Renown or R6 credits. To keep up with the big changes and exciting new additions coming in year six of Rainbow Six Siege, subscribe to this channel and visit us at news.ubisoft.com. This season, we'll see some renovations coming to the destructible halls and perilous balconies of Border. For more on our latest map rework, here's level designer Jeremy Dowsett. For Border, it's very easy fixes. We have an awful lot of data on the map, but it was mainly lines of sight and some of the bomb sites were actually a little bit too congested. We've extended bathroom and tellers and two objectives. They're just a little bit bigger now, so it actually aids in the movement for the players. We made bathroom a little bit bigger, and there's a breakable wall that goes towards tellers now next to the window. We also moved the hatch around. You could always get pinched in tellers or bathroom, so adding the hatch or moving the hatch in bathroom and changing around some of the walls and extending them, so moving the bathroom more into tellers and moving that window across a little bit, really changes the flow of that area. We also changed armory archives. So the room shape has changed a little bit and it's got extended. The covers got cleaned up an awful lot, but we've actually extended it just to make it breathe an awful lot more. So we did touch customs and stock as well. Um, there's less destructible walls, um, so it's better to defend. It's not easy to defend, it's better to defend. And there's a few more a few more covers and the covers have been tweaked. Because customs and stock, I think it was one of the sites that people didn't like as much as the other sites in the map. So we went through and did some very strategic changes. Along with that, vents and workshop hasn't changed at all. Everybody's complaint about border was always the helicopter noise and the helicopter noise that was just, you know, very hard to hear stuff inside. The helicopter noise has been brought down, so it's less of an interference when you're actually playing. And the voice that actually you hear over the tannoy system, that only happens now in the prep phase. It won't happen when you're actually playing. So now you'll actually be able to hear when people are coming and when walls are being breached, etc. You'll be able to hear everything because you have less helicopter whopping around on top of your head and you don't have that guy on the tannoy talking all the time. There was a lack of rotation internally on the map, so we added a balcony across towards uh, east stairs, towards break room. You know, you go from security into break across this great big walkway now that takes you out to east stairs. And it's not a massive change, but adding little things like that really does aid the navigation and the rotation. Cleaning up clutter across the map as well also is a huge improvement because, you know, you learn over time there's lots of props and lots of things just all over the place that just gets in the way of lines of sight when you're trying to fight and when you're trying to shoot. So cleaning those out at the same time was a massive improvement. We added a exterior balcony, so rather than repel, you can actually just go up towards archives from exterior now. It actually aids in getting to the building a little bit quicker. Think of this rework more in the vein of something like when we did Clubhouse or Cafe. Small tweaks make a huge, huge difference. You know, we playtest the maps and we have playtests with pro players. You give a map to 60 plus million players, they're going to find things that we haven't thought of and they're going to play it a different way or they're going to find exploits. 
that we didn't find. And that's a great thing, which is why we have the test server. So these issues can come out and we can fix them because we are very reactive when a map is released and goes onto the test server. We can be very reactive and we can fix them very, very quickly, which is why R6 fix. And I implore you all, if you find issues, please screenshot it. Please take a video and please put it on R6 fix. It is a valuable resource for us and for the community. R4 eliminated. We've given you a glimpse of Flores in action, but for more on our explosive new attacker, here's Emilian Lome, game designer, and Simon Ducharme, universe writer. I think one of the inspiration we had is from old past gaming experiences from like guided device, guided missile that you would end up in the first person view of this device and they would move forward constantly and accelerate and you had to adapt your trajectory to find your targets. And we wanted to introduce something like that in the game. Those devices in those older games are usually like guided missile that would one shot everyone. And re recreating the oomph aspect of those devices in Siege was obviously a challenge. And eventually, we retained this very large explosion. We kept it in the device, it's just that to make sure that it would not be too lethal, we added this delay. So as soon as you end your trajectory, you anchor, and you have this three seconds timer that starts ticking down. So achieving your goals with Torres is very satisfying, just as we envisioned it in the first place. And also, it's, I feel, quite fair in the context of Siege as most defenders, as soon as they learn how to play around, have the tools at their disposal to react. The first, uh, I guess, uh, role is gadget removal, like deployable shield, the Lucy, the Maestro's turret, um, barbed wire. Second role is to make anchors move out of position. Like there's a lot of very strong defender position in the game. Uh, it will be able to accurately place this device under the feet of a defender, and at that point, the defender has to move. Uh, he's good at clearing the way for others, but others may need to clear the way for his uh, device. I, I think specifically of electrified barbed wire, and you might need someone else to deal with the battery so that you can access the site. Or you're gonna have to use one of your own device to get rid of the entire barbed wire. The other operator is going to work quite well with are the breachers. So using the retro in combination with a breacher is going to be great, specifically against bandits. And once it detonates, it's going to remove the battery, if there is any. And it's going to also, because the explosion is fairly huge, force bandits out of that position, which means that by the time it comes back to the wall to trick, the wall might already be up. However, contrary to Thatcher, he has to get his device in the objective room, which means that if Bandit himself or another defender is watching, they can destroy it before you get into location. So the two main counters, like mechanical one-to-one -one counters, I would say are Mute and Mazi. Mute is going to just stop the device where it is, with the caveat that if you do destroy the Mute, then the Ratero is going to detonate eventually. The radius of the Mute jammer is bigger than the radius of the explosion. So if you drive straight to a mute jammer, you're gonna be muted before you can anchor and detonate. And if you, if you anchor before that, the explosion radius is gonna be too short to actually deal with the mute jammer. And the other one is uh, Mudzi. So Mudzi is simply going to jump on it and overload the device and destroy it. So both Mudzi and the Ratero are gonna be destroyed in this uh, instance. So no explosion, Mudzi won't take control of the Ratero because it's a time device, it's not like a permanent device. It's a very loud, very big, very obvious device. And as a defender, it's going to be easy to shoot it. The main counter, if you are a maestro or a bandit, is to have a friend of yours watching for the drone holes and shooting the device before it gets to you. Do you want to come in careful? Flores comes equipped, as far as loadout goes, with the AR-33, which is from Thatcher, and the SR-25, which is the DMR of Blackbeard, obviously to not have a shield on that DMR. But for the sidearm, he has just the GSH-18, uh, so the sidearm of Hughes, for example. And uh, for the secondary gadgets, uh, one of the first options we wanted to give him was a Claymore, because when, when you use the retro device, you are obviously very vulnerable. And having a Claymore to cover at least one avenue of flanking on your location felt like it was a very natural fit for Flores. 
And as a secondary option, uh, if you want to dive more into the chaos potential of the operator, we bring um, flashbangs. Combining your own right hero and flashing to enter, this can create a lot of uh, movements. We wanted uh, sort of a character that was a little bit of a wild card, something you don't really expect to see in Rainbow. And we thought that Master Thief was a very uh, good profile for that. Flores was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He was raised by his mom alone. It was a, kind of a rough childhood because his mom's health kind of slowly declined as he aged. So as a teen, he kind of got involved in organized crime, but he realized that he hated that because he saw what it did to his community and his mom had taught him like empathy above all. He decided to go to a military college instead to see if like that kind of path, which was like more righteous, would be better for him. And he ultimately got a military engineering degree. He also learned that authority does not work with him. Then he said, well, I hate what organized crime is doing to my home. So I'm going to be a thorn in their side, basically. And so he became a burglar. He started hitting uh, big targets, crime lords, all that to uh, basically re redistribute their money to the community that was suffering. Uh, and that's how he became known as the man from Flores, which is where his, his name came from. That's how he found his passion for tinkering and making his own tools, because you always need a key to open a door and the doors are not always the same. <laughs> he wasn't caught or anything. They never knew who he was until uh, they followed the money and realized uh, that it was being given back to the community and everything. But the one thing that stood out to them was uh, his mother's hospital bills. They actually killed his mother and they were going to kill him as well. But uh, Ash found him. So she was in Buenos Aires investigating uh, smuggling rings basically. And she just happened upon him and he had the information she needed. So she offered him asylum in the USA and he was very happy to take that because he had nowhere to be anymore. So he went to Los Angeles and started a new life. Most people don't have the morals that he has. Most people that have the morals that he has don't have the skill set of a thief. So he's always felt very like, no one is like me. No one cares in the same way that I do. Yeah, going to Rainbow, he's finding some kindred spirits and it's basically a new chapter that he didn't know was possible. One of the highly anticipated features that we've been working on is Match Replay. And we're excited to announce that this season, it's going beyond the test server. With the help of all of your feedback, we will be releasing Match Replay Beta to all PC players at the launch of Crimson Heist. Here to tell us more are Mihai Lakatas and Wei Yu. So putting uh, Match Replay on the live is actually the big moment for us. Uh, we put it on TS, uh, we get the feedback, we improve we improve the match replay, we know it's stable, but the big test is always live. When we first put it on the test server, like a lot of people were saying like, hey, it would be nice, you know, where you can select the round or like go directly to that round. And we realized like, especially in rank, for example, it can have 15 rounds. So if you want to go to the last round, just keeping 14 rounds, that would be crazy. So it's coming up, it's you just gonna have this possibility to select the one that you want to go in. So you will be able to go fast forward or rewind and you have also a timeline where you can actually select a point on the timeline and go back and forth and go also in slow motion. I will take this opportunity to address to the community when you will want to go forward in time and uh, there will be a little delay so uh, don't worry we already know it's a known issue so you just have to wait until it loads uh, when you jump forward but uh, when you go backwards in time, it will be almost instantaneously. And I know people are very excited and sometimes they're asking, well, why is that coming up faster? It's just like, we want to make sure um, our game is robust and also the feature is very, it's very stable uh, for this. But first we put it on PC, we want to see how it works. We want to make sure it's very stable and then we want to also put it on, uh, on the consoles. I think on the highest level of competition, it will help them to get even better. Um, just because the replay functionality will give players, analysts, coaches, and the teams to really deep dive into each round, into each match, and see what happens throughout the game. 
Uh, they can analyze the strategies, the timings, the positions of every operator at any given time, and that is huge. Think of a world where the biggest replays or the replays of the biggest matches in the world of a major, of a final, of the Six Invitational will be readily available that you can really watch and tune in and relive that moment as the player. Um, I think that's probably a mid to long term goal, but that's our ambition and we want people to go into those replay files, be able to share it and maybe even for us to publish this um, for the wider audience. Regardless if you're a beginner, you're just learning the game right now, if you're a casual or if you're a pro player, if you're a content creator, if you're a caster, regardless what you are, please uh, try this feature. It's awesome, it's really nice. We will always read your feedback and together we can build a match replay, which is much better and it will make everyone happy in the end. So make sure once it's out, you go out and try it. We will listen for your feedback. A new Elite skin will also be available tomorrow. Let's take a closer look at Kali's Elite skin, the Master Frame Prototype 1. Crimson Heist is dropping tomorrow on the test server with the reworked border map, Operator Flores, and match replay beta. Not to mention that brand new secondary gadget, the Gon 6. Be sure to check it out. And before we wrap up this panel, we have one last surprise that we wanted to tease today. The Rainbow Six Siege board game. <laughs>